Thanks for the kind words and thanks everybody for showing up. We've got a packed house. So I'm going to tell you today about what we're calling the dawn of gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, this is hot news. You might recall just last month, LIGO made the announcement that they had discovered gravitational waves uh, for the first time from two merging black holes. So I'll put that in context, say why is that important? It's exciting that Einstein is right. But it's even more exciting that we're now going to change the way we understand the universe using this new tool. I'll highlight the discovery that we've made, and then I'll tell you what's coming in the future. So first, we're going to rewind, and we're going to talk about astronomy throughout human history. Okay? So humans can't help themselves. They're bored. They look up at the night sky. And eat before there was science, before there were telescopes, we were noticing that there were patterns in the night sky. Okay, and we know those are constellations. Now, the ancients also noticed that there were stars in the night sky that did not fit the pattern. They moved around relative to the fixed constellations we see. Okay, so the really bright one there is, is the planet Jupiter. The, pl the word planet means wanderer. It's stars that seem to wander through the night sky. All right? And this, this was basically our understanding of astronomy for thousands of years. There are stars. Some of them move. Some of them don't. Fast forward to about 400 years ago, and Galileo really invented the field of astronomy as we know it today by taking the telescope, which was invented before Galileo's time, but turning it to the heavens instead of just using it to spy on his neighbors. And what he, Galileo noticed is here is Galileo's view of Jupiter using a telescope like this. And this is the view of Jupiter you would get if you used a decent pair of binoculars today. And Galileo noticed that there were four what looked like stars next to Jupiter, and they would move around from night to night. And he concluded that these were actually moons of the planet Jupiter that were orbiting Jupiter, and then inferred that small things go around big things, and so that the Earth was going around the Sun, which we now take for granted. But in his day, this was a very unpopular idea, and Galileo spent the rest of his life under house arrest. Nonetheless, today we, we realize that that is, is how it goes. And for the next 400 years, astronomy was the story of making bigger and better telescopes. Until now, we have you know, fu futuristic telescopes that are still under development. So the, the history of astronomy for hundreds of years was the story of collecting more light, making bigger and bigger telescopes. And now we have a more modern view of Jupiter, which shows you these amazing cloud patterns. And there's one of Jupiter's moons poking out from behind. Okay? And this is the view of Jupiter that might be more familiar to you. So that view of Jupiter is just a tiny sliver of the information that's coming to us from Jupiter. And it's the tiny sliver that you are actually sensitive to with your eye. So all of, all of this stuff that you might have heard of, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet light, infrared light, it's all the same stuff. It's all light. It's all electromagnetic radiation. And there's just a tiny, wafer sl uh, <laughs> thin sliver, visible light, that you can see with your eyes. And so not only was the history of astronomy about building bigger telescopes, but in the last 50 years, thanks a lot to this town, the history of astronomy was also building telescopes in space that could access these different kinds of light. Okay, so we have, well, we have giant radio telescopes on the ground. We have infrared telescopes in space. Here's Hubble, which is visible light telescope, but it's in space so it can see very deep and very clear. And we have things like X-ray telescopes as well. And if you combine all these different kinds of light, and train them on the same object, train them on Jupiter, you can learn things about the object you couldn't learn just using the visible light. So here's our familiar visible light image. Here's what Jupiter looks like in x-rays. You can see there's a lot of action going on at the poles. This is, if you've ever seen the northern lights here on Earth, there are aurora on Jupiter as well, but those are bright in the x-ray. Here's uh, some storms on Jupiter in the infrared. You can see that different bands of clouds are bright in infrared, and they're dark and visible. And in the radio, you can see that there's dust around Jupiter that's bright in the radio. Okay, so all this information you couldn't learn just using the light that, that you can collect with your eyes. We need to develop these different kinds of telescopes. All right, so that's, that's almost everything we know about the universe has come to us from light. All of human history, we've been collecting light and we've been using light from the universe to understand what's going on out there at these great distances. But now, literally, Within the last couple of weeks, there has been a revolution, and we now have a new tool to learn about the universe. We're going to use gravity 
as our messenger from the cosmos instead of just light, okay? And to understand how this works, we need to understand a little bit about gravity. And our concept of gravity comes to us from probably the most famous scientist, Albert Einstein. Before Einstein's time, the force of gravity that we knew came to us from Isaac Newton, who's probably the second most famous scientist. And, and Isaac Newton said that the force of gravity, it was just this mutual attraction between two objects. Okay, so, so I have mass and you have mass, and so according to Newton, I'm pulling on you and you're pulling on me with this mysterious force of gravity. And Newton could calculate what that force was, but he had no understanding, no one had any understanding of why it worked. And it was this great mystery for hundreds of years until Einstein came along. And Einstein completely tore up the history books and came up with a radical new idea. That gravity was not a force between the two of us, and that space, the space between the two of us isn't empty. The space between us can, can be curved and can be warped and can move around. Empty space is not empty, it's dynamic. It has, it has character. And masses, heavy things, warp the space around them. Okay? So here's a cartoon of that. So here's a, a picture of the sun. And the blue lines are supposed to represent space around the sun. And you can see that the, the blue lines kind of curve as, the, as you get close to the sun, where the mass is really high, the universe gets warped. And the Earth is just traveling along, and it goes on this curved path because it's traveling through the curved space. This is a rather radical idea. But if you've ever, I think they have one in the lobby here. There's those funnels, and you can stick the coin in, and the coin just travels around the funnel. So that's like the Earth orbiting the sun. It's that coin just traveling on that curved path. Okay? It's, it's a completely different concept of gravity, but, but Einstein came up with this idea, and like a good scientist, made some important predictions, came up with things that we could measure that could only be explained if this curvature were true. And all of those predictions have been found and have been exactly, precisely as Einstein predicted, except for one. And that one remaining one was what we call gravitational waves. So here's another cartoon of, of what gravitational waves are all about. So the, the picture before, we had the big sun causing a huge warp in space, and then the puny little Earth just kind of rolling around on that, on that curved space. But if you have two really massive things that each curve space quite a lot, and they're orbiting around one another, they're going to stir up the space around them, kind of like if you, had a, if you had a pond and you had two sticks and you were swirling them in, and then you'll see ripples traveling out in space, just like you'd see ripples traveling out on the surface of the pond. Okay? So what Einstein realized is that masses that are moving around will cause the shape of space to change, and that changed shape will propagate throughout the universe at the speed of light. Einstein realized this in his equations in 1916, and at the end of the paper where he, where he wrote these equations down, discarded them and said, well, this is really interesting and it was a fun calculation, but the, it's such a weak effect that it will never be of any use. So even the greats of Einstein, um, their, their imagination was limited just because of the, the incredible amount of technology it takes to, to make these kinds of measurements. So the universe is going to produce gravitational waves for us, and we're, we just now have the, the technology to measure them. So to understand what sort of sources we can find, we have to understand how the universe can make gravitational waves. And it's actually quite simple. So here's a, here's a recipe. You can try this one at home. What you need to do is you need to take a bunch of matter or energy. And if you remember, E equals mc squared. Matter and energy are the same thing. So as far as Einstein concern, is concerned, it doesn't make a difference. And what you want to do is you want to squish that energy or that matter together in a, in a dense little blob. And the reason you want to squish it together real dense is because then you get lots of curvature. The denser you squish something together, the more it warps the space around it. And what's even better is if you can bust it up into two very dense lumps. And then just shake them up. That's all you got to do. And the gravitational waves will ripple through. So here we go. Ready? Yeah. All right. We're making gravitational waves. Now, the gravitational waves we're making will never, ever, 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 ever be calculated. Okay, that's good. Good, good gravitational waves. We're trying, we're running these detectors. Everyone be quiet now. Okay, so, so those are so weak that there's no way we could ever hopefully detect those sorts of gravitational waves. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of math that, that Albert Einstein was doing when he was figuring out if these would be of any use. Okay? Come on. Aha. But what Albert Einstein didn't know is that the universe is a much more radical place than we realized in the, in the early 1900s. For instance, at, in, the, in the time of Einstein, we didn't know about black holes. 
Now, black holes are the densest thing the universe knows how to make. In fact, formally, they have infinite density, which doesn't even make any sense. So here we have a cartoon picture of two black holes in space, okay? And if they're close enough to each other, they'll orbit around each other. So this is our perfect scenario, right? We have two very dense things, and they're stirred up because they're orbiting around each other, and so as they go, they're going to emit gravitational waves. This is the key source of gravitational waves that we're looking at, is two dense objects like black holes orbiting around each other. Now, I have a question for the audience. Now, here's the deal, right? It's a multiple choice question. Everyone has to answer. You vote with your hands. I'm gonna watch, and if anyone doesn't vote, you have to stand up and tell me your answer out loud. All right? So I'm watching. You better vote. So the question, I have to make sure I get it right. It's a big screen. Is what happens to the black holes, right? Yes, as they emit these gravitational waves. Okay, we have four choices. They get closer together, they get further apart, they shrink, or they grow. Think about it for a second. You can consult with your neighbor if you want. This isn't a test. Murmur, 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 murmur. Okay, all right, Con consultation is over. Who thinks the black holes get closer together? Who was visiting Wikipedia before they came to the talk? Who thinks the gravitational waves get further apart? Okay, who thinks they get smaller? You're half right. Who thinks they get bigger? Okay, the right answer, mostly, is that the gravitational waves get close together. So give yourself a pat on the back. Okay. Good job, good job. Okay, all right. So they're gonna get closer together. So as the gravitational waves get close, now, now imagine, imagine the figure skater who starts spinning and has their arms out. And as they bring their arms in, what happens? They spin faster. So as the black holes get closer together because they're emitting gravitational waves, they'll start moving faster as well, okay? So they start off emitting some gravitational waves, they get closer, they move faster, the gravitational waves get stronger, which makes them get closer together, which makes them go faster, which makes them emit stronger gravitational waves until eventually they merge together. So they start off far apart and the gravitational waves that they stir up forces them to come together until they merge and in a fantastic burst of energy that all just gets dumped into the space around them and that energy goes propagating through the universe and, and comes to Earth. Okay, now, we want to receive these gravitational waves as they come to us from these merging black holes. And the question is, what is the sort of thing that we could try to measure, okay? Now remember, the gravitational waves change the shape of space around them, and they're gonna come washing over the Earth, and so what is the sort of thing that, they, that we could try to measure? How do they change as they pass by? Do they change how much an object weighs? Do they change the distance between objects, how fast objects fall, or how dense objects are? You can consult with your neighbors. Okay, this is the, this is the second most important question of the day. So how, do, how, how are we gonna me measure gravitational waves? What are they gonna change around us? Who thinks they're gonna change how much objects weigh? That's a tricky answer because we're talking about gravity. Who thinks they're going to change the distance between objects? There were definitely some Wikipedia visitors. <laughs> How fast objects fall? Technically true, but that's not what we measure. And the density of objects. Uh, and the correct answer is the distance between objects. <laughs> okay, so, so let's rewind and remember what's going on here, right? So we have two black holes. They're colliding together. They're causing gravitational waves to travel through the universe, and those gravitational waves are going to change the distances between objects. So there are gravitational waves going through us right now, which means you and I are, are moving closer and further apart from one another as I speak, imperceptibly so, okay? So if we wanna measure gravitational waves, what we have to do is we have to measure distances. Now here's a little shock value. We're gonna, we're gonna be inspired by how spiders find their prey in their web. So I don't, know if, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid and an adult, I liked to throw bugs on spider webs, okay? And it's amazing because the spider goes right to where the bug is. So how does the spider know where the bug is? I'll, I'll answer this one. Because the spider, oh no, there we go. 
So the spider is holding on to threads of the web. And when the bug lands in the web, it causes the threads to shake, which causes the spider to shake. Okay? And the spider can tell, depending on which legs are shaking in which direction, where the bug is, and can zip along that line of the web to get dinner. So what we're going to do is we want to basically, the spider's legs are like rulers that are measuring the position of the web. Okay? And so we want to be inspired by that. We want to build very good rulers. And instead of putting them on a spider web, we want to put them out in space. Okay? And as the gravitational waves go by, it's going to change the distance that those rulers are measuring, and we'll know that, that we're, we're watching black holes collide. Oh, there goes the gravitational waves. Okay, so the greatest rulers ever built by humans, so far, are the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatories, which is a mouthful, so we call them LIGO. Okay, there are two LIGO detectors, the first one is in Louisiana, which isn't all that far away. So here's, a, here's a, an aerial view of one of the LIGO detectors in Louisiana. This is a normal-sized building. Right here are normal-sized cars. And this is a two-and-a-half-mile-long tube with no air in it. It's the, I don't, it used to be something like the longest vacuum or the longest single spiral weld. It has some really cool superlative. And then there's an identical tool, uh, tube going off the, this direction as well. Okay? So it's a giant L-shaped hole in the atmosphere. Two and a half miles going one way, two and a half miles going the other way. Okay? And at the end of these two and a half mile long tubes are highly polished mirrors. And these highly polished mirrors are part of this very exotic suspension system that protect them from the motion of the ground. So these mirrors are basically just like the Earth following that curved path through space. There's no, there are no forces on, on the ground that are causing the mirrors to move around to a certain approximation. Okay? So now we have the mirrors, and now we, what we want to do is want to measure the distance to those mirrors to incredible accuracy. And the way we do that is with lasers. Here we go. So it, in, the, in the house, there is the most stable laser ever built, and that laser gets sent down each arm. So a little burst of laser light comes out, it gets split in half, and half of the laser goes down one arm. Come on, laser. There we go. And the other half of the laser goes down the other arm. And it hits the mirrors at the end, and then it comes back. Okay? Now, how fast does light travel in a vacuum? The speed of light. Exactly, okay? Light always travels the speed of light. And so what we're going to use is we're going to use the speed of light as our ruler. So if someone says, oh, how far away is Birmingham? I would say, it's an hour and a half. I didn't give you a distance, I gave you a time, but you know how fast I'm going to drive. So time can be used as a ruler, especially if you know the speed. And we know the speed of light very, very well. So if the light goes down one arm, and comes back before the light comes back from the other arm, we know that the arms are not the same distance. They're not the same length. Now we try very hard to keep them the same length, and by measuring the arrival time of the light from each arm, we can tell if the, light, if the length of the arms have changed. Okay? And this will happen in a very predictable pattern if that change is due to gravitational waves. So, the, so I'll show you the LIGO dance. Ready? Here's the LIGO dance. Okay, here we go. This is what we're looking for. Okay, we're looking for the, sh the distance of the arms to change as the gravitational waves go by. Okay, now I said there are two detectors. There's one in, in Louisiana. The other one is in Washington State. Now, if you've, if you've ever seen a postcard about Washington State, it's big mountains with snow caps and, and lots of green trees. This is what most of Washington State looks like. It's a barren desert. And all the pretty trees are right there by the ocean. So there's, there's not a lot of action going on in central Washington state, so they let us build a giant detector there. So this one is, is on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. It's called the Hanford Observatory. And it's exactly the same dimension. It's exactly the same laser. Everything about it is the same, except for its spot on Earth. Now, why do you suppose we don't want two of them? Because the thing we're trying to measure, this change in length, is phenomenally small. It's so small that when I try to describe it, it just doesn't make sense. So the, the arms are, 
are two and a half miles long, and the change in the arm we're trying to measure due to gravitational waves going by is smaller than the width of a proton. Okay, now, okay, so atoms are really small, and the centers of atoms are the nucleus of the atoms, which are really, really small, and the nucleus of the atom is made of protons and neutrons, which are small, so small we can't even actually measure how small they are. Okay? And what we're looking for is something moving at less than the width of a proton, which is insane. So for the physicists in the room, we are limited by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We can't tell how close things are, how big things are at those scales. Okay? So what the, the physicists like to say is that what we've done is we've built a kilometer scale quantum mechanical system. Which is cool. <laughs> and it worked. So <laughs> So, uh, LIGO has been around for, for decades. They started construction in 1995, and the first observing run happened in, in around 2002. But we knew that we weren't going to be able to detect any gravitational waves. We were just learning how to build this machine. There's nothing like it in the world. This is a brand new kind of science. It's an incredible precision measurement we have to make. So there were, we had the training wheels on. And over the years, the sensitivity got better and better. And then this fall, well, late this summer, we opened up the seals on our brand new upgraded detectors, we call them advanced LIGO. They're the most sensitive detectors we've ever built, and everyone was, I wouldn't say optimistic, but excited about the new sensitivity that we, that we had achieved. And the plan was that we'll run the detectors for a couple of months, we'll learn about how they work now that we've made all these upgrades, we'll shut them down, We'll tweak them to make them even better, and then we'll start them up again this summer. So we turned them on, and we're all sitting around having coffee, and we got one right off the bat. It was, it was actually the first day of formal observations. This thing arrived. So here's the actual data. It's from September 14th, 2000, and what year is this, 16? That was 2015, though, because it was before January. Okay, so... <laughs> So, so here's the actual data. This is the data collected at the Washington facility. And then in blue here is the data collected at the Louisiana facility. And the y-axis here is in units of 10 to the minus 21. Okay, so that's 21 zeros, a decimal point, 21 zeros, and then a 1 is the, is the strain that we have to measure, is the change in length that we're having to measure, okay? This is phenomenally small. You just can't even comprehend how small this is. And so, here's just the noise that we talked about earlier. It's just, you know, the detector is jiggling around. And then you notice that it's kind of making this wavy pattern. And if I look at the data from the other detector, it's making the same wavy pattern. Now, gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. And so what I had to do is that we had to shift the data by a few milliseconds between the two detectors to get them to line up that perfectly. And that's not actually how we do our data analysis, but it's just a cute thing to do when we make pictures. And then down here, the red line here and the blue line here is the prediction that we would get for the merger of two black holes from Einstein's theory of relativity. Okay? So I've never built a gravitational wave detector in my life. I just have my computer that knows how to solve Einstein's equations. I calculate what one of these signals look like. Somebody shows up to me with some gravitational wave detector data. I compare my prediction to the, the measurement, and they're perfect. It, we cannot measure any deviation from our theoretical prediction, the red and blue lines down here, to our measured data up there. It was shocking. Sh I cannot express to you how shocking it was. <laughs> so so the, it showed up on the, on the September 14th at about 5 o'clock in the morning. At about lunchtime, we knew we had something serious. At about dinner time, we knew it wasn't fake. And I got my first night of sleep in February. So here is a, here's a uh, computer simulation of what those two black holes merging together would look like, okay, if you were nearby. So the, the two black holes, one of them was about 32 times the mass of the sun. The other one was about 28 times the mass of the sun. And as they're orbiting around each other, you can see the background stars kind of wobbling around. That's because as the gravitational waves go out, they're warping space and the light has to travel through that warp space. So it's like you have two magnifying glasses and you're kind of moving them around over a field of stars. And so you can see them kind of warp. And then they merge into one, and then what we're left with is one big black hole. 
Now let's see here. The first one was about 32 times the mass of the sun. The second one was about 28 times the mass of the sun. So you add those together, you get something that's about 70 times the mass of the sun. And we can measure the mass of the leftover black hole, and it was about 67 times the mass of the sun. So we lost three suns worth of mass in this process. Where did those three suns worth of mass go? It, into the gravitational waves. Okay, so what we've done is we've converted three times the mass of the sun into pure energy. Okay, nuclear weapons convert like a mosquito into pure energy. We converted three suns into pure energy. So if we had dumped that energy into light instead of gravitational waves, we would have seen this merger happen. It would have been brighter than the full moon, and it happened in a galaxy a billion light years away. So if, if we could see gravitational waves, if you were wandering around at 5 o'clock in the morning on September 14th, 2015, there would have been a flash that lasted about a millisecond, brighter than the full moon, from a billion light years away. Okay? Normally, everything you see in the night sky is from a few thousand light years away, tops. Okay? It's a lot of energy. So, great, we discovered gravitational waves, LIGO works, we're all done, rest on our laurels, it's over. No, this has only just begun. So we, had, we have two gravitational wave detectors in the US. LIGO shares data and technology with another gravitational wave detector in uh, Germany called GEO. And currently under construction is a gravitational wave detector in Italy called Virgo. Now Virgo has collected data before, just like LIGO has collected data before. LIGO did all of their advanced detector upgrades, and now Virgo's in the middle of their advanced detector upgrades. So now no one's collecting data right now, but we're gonna start again sometime this summer, maybe in the fall, and by the end of the next observing run, we hope to add Virgo to our detector network as well. Also under construction is a identical facility to LIGO that will go somewhere in India. We're still trying to figure out exactly where the best place to put it is. We want to be in a place where there's not so many earthquakes. And I don't know how much you know about India, but there's big mountains there in some places, so we have to choose wisely. And there's also a facility under construction in Japan, which has lots of earthquakes and basically no flat ground. And so in Japan, they're building their gravitational wave detector in a mountain. Okay? It's, like, it's like an evil villain plan, right? They're boring out tunnels, kilometer-long tunnels in a mountain and they're building a gravitational wave detector called Kagra. And they're like actually physically, that's, that's a picture of the tunnel that they've bored and there's the beam tube that's gonna have the lasers go down. So we expect Kagra to come online sometime at the end of this decade or the beginning of next decade. Uh, same deal for the, for the Indian detector and we'll have a worldwide network of these facilities. And with them, we have many, many more things that we hope to discover. Now we've seen the merger of of two black holes and that was really great and we know that we're going to be just swimming in mergers of black holes as our sensitivity improves okay in fact we estimate that uh, uh, gravitational waves from the mergers of two black holes hits the earth about once every 15 minutes so during this talk at least three or four gravitational waves have gone by okay now we're not able to detect all of them most of them are too weak but as our detectors improve we're going to be seeing these things routinely we're going to be very busy so Help, come help. So, so there's a, a simulation of two black holes merging, but something we're very keen to see, and honestly the thing we thought we would see first, would be the mergers of neutron stars, okay? So stars that are about 10 times the mass of the sun, when they die, become neutron stars, which are basically like city-sized atomic nuclei. And we know that neutron stars form in pairs because we can observe some of them in our galaxy. And we think that when neutron stars merge, just like when black holes merge, they produce these, these phenomena we've known about for many, many years called gamma ray bursts. There are these flashes of gamma ray light in the sky. And it's quite a mystery as to where they come from. And so the, the hope is that they come from, from the mergers of neutron stars and we'll be able to measure neutron stars colliding together with gravitational waves and see the flash with gamma rays and together really understand what's going on with neutron stars. Well, who cares about neutron stars? Well, scientists care about neutron stars. One of the things that's really neat is, like I said, they're, they're, they're city-sized atomic nuclei. 
We have no idea how matter behaves at those scales at those densities. We cannot make something that dense in a lab. So if we really want to understand nuclear physics in this extreme regime, we really need to do it with, with gravitational waves and, and gamma rays together. We would also be very excited to see a supernova explosion of a star in the, in the neighborhood, our galaxy or one of a, a very nearby galaxy. We know that supernova explosions happen a lot. We measure them with light all the time. We have no idea why. We have a rough sketch, right? So there's a star, it collapses, it hits the core, it bounces, there's an explosion. But we really theoretically do not understand why that works. The, if, if a supernova goes off in our galaxy, we would receive gravitational waves from that, uh, from that supernova, which would help us probe in the core of what's actually happening. And then there's some crazy stuff too. There's these crazy ideas that, called cosmic strings that are kind of left over from when the universe started off really small and got really big. Who knows? Maybe we'll see something like that. There are these neutron stars that spin very fast, and if they have bumps on them, those bumps will emit gravitational waves, so we can measure how smooth neutron stars are in our galaxy. The smoothest one we've measured can't have any bumps on it bigger than a few centimeters. It's the size of a city, okay? And we can measure that it can't have any bumps bigger than a few centimeters. That's insane. And then, ultimately, gravitational waves from the Big Bang would cause the entire universe to jiggle like a bowl of jelly. And depending on your favorite flavor of Big Bang and how the universe started small and got big, there might be this sort of residual jiggling of the universe that might be detectable with something like LIGO. We might have to build a bigger machine to get there. So, we're building bigger machines too. Okay, so, so just like we have different kinds of telescopes to see different kinds of light, we need different kinds of gravitational wave detectors to measure different kinds of gravitational waves. Okay, so here's LIGO in, in, the, in the bottom corner. Okay, LIGO measures very short wavelength, very high energy gravitational waves. So if you want to make the analogy with, with traditional astronomy, LIGO is like the X-ray or gamma ray telescope of, of the gravitational wave field. At lower frequencies, at longer wavelengths, there's exciting science to be done. To do that, you, you can't use LIGO because LIGO is on the ground and we can shield our detectors from the ground shaking to a certain point. But as you go to lower frequencies, there's just nothing you can do. The Earth is just too wobbly. So we would like to build a gravitational wave detector in space. We've had plans to do this for decades. We just need about $2 billion. So if anybody knows somebody, let me know. But currently, so the, the mission in space is called LISA. Currently, as we speak, there's a, a spacecraft called LISA Pathfinder out there in space testing the critical technologies that we would need to, to measure gravitational waves in space. And so it uses the same basic idea. It uses this idea of using lasers as your, as your ruler to measure distances between spacecraft. So we know that this whole idea of using lasers to measure gravitational waves works. And now we're testing that we can build something this sensitive in space. And so now we're just a few steps away from, from actually putting one of these detectors. We can also use a, a, a naturally provided ruler in the universe. We talked about those stars that spin really fast. They're called pulsars. And we can measure the distance to pulsars very accurately using radio telescopes. So there's this big effort where the Earth is kind of the center of the spider and different pulsars in our galaxy are kind of the, the arms. And you're trying to watch for the, the distance to the pulsars to all sort of change, just like we're watching uh, the shape of LIGO to change. And finally, there's one more idea where we can actually use light from the, the, er, the earliest light, the oldest light in the universe, coming to us from, from basically right after the Big Bang, would have a... a you, who's ever worn polarized glasses? Okay, so polarized glasses, if you wear them a certain way and tilt your head, it gets dark, and then tilt your head back and it gets light again. So the, the light from the very beginning of the universe, we think will be polarized due to gravitational waves from the Big Bang and when the universe started off small and got big. But that's a very difficult experiment, a very hard measurement, and people are still working on that one. So, in summary, everything we know about the universe, how big it is, how old it is, what it's made of, has come to us from light until September. And now we have a brand new channel to learn about the universe using gravity instead of light. And we've only scratched the surface just using this, 
you know, we have one detection in this one very tiny part of parameter space, these two black holes merging together. But those machines are going to get more and more sensitive over the next couple of years, and this will become a routine tool that we use to understand the universe. And soon we will have other tools in place to measure this effect in different places. So by the time you are all professional astronomers, you will use gravitational waves as part of your toolkit to understand the universe just like people today use telescopes. It has been a true revolution and it's only just begun. The discovery is exciting and we're all very happy, but now the real work has begun as we learn about the universe in this new way. So I will leave you with this cool movie of the two black holes going around and I will entertain your questions as long as you have them. Thank you. Um, so when you have uh, light waves, when you're detecting light waves, we know that you can think of light as a duality between particles, particles and waves. You can think of light as particle or a wave. Um, does, do gravitational waves have the same duality? Can, are there gravitational particles? Right, so, so general relativity, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and not get too nerdy here. So <laughs> general relativity is, is what we call a classical field of physics which means all of the propagation, all the math in general relativity uses just the wave picture. But one of the great, not one of, the greatest mystery in fundamental physics is why gravity is different from everything else. So all of our other understanding of theoretical physics, you, like you mentioned, there's this particle wave duality. You're in the regime where quantum mechanics rules. And gravity doesn't work that way. And if you try to make them work, if you try to think about gravity on very small scales, it is completely pathological. It can't be done. So we know there's something wrong, either with our preconceived notion that everything should eventually fit together at some scale, or with our theory of gravity. So one of the great things about gravitational waves is that it gives us a way to probe gravity in a regime that we've never been able to probe before in the lab. We're measuring high curvature, high velocity gravitational fields, which is not something you can do in your basement, okay? So the, the two black holes that merged were moving at about half the speed of light when they came together, which is a very tricky place for, for gravity to be acting, and we, we can bore into that part of the signal and look for departures from theory. So far, everything we've measured matched our predictions, but this is something we're very hopeful. We would be desperate, we would be so excited to see a place where the theory didn't match the data, and that would give us a crack of light into understanding how to, con you know, how to combine gravity with the rest of theoretical physics. We have a question. And I'm sorry, um, you probably explained that, but um, uh, the gra gravitational uh, waves, they will be used to discuss or study different phenomena, you said, including the two black holes colliding, right? I just want to understand again whether you, what you knew about these two black holes colliding before that LIGO measured anything, or did you discover it when that happened? That's, I'm trying to find that connection. Great. So I would have planted that question. <laughs> so so what, we, what we observed was the collision of two black holes 30 times the mass of the sun a billion light years away. There is no telescope on Earth or ever to be planned that could have made that measurement. The only way we could have known about this system is through the gravitational waves they emitted. These were the, the heaviest stellar mass of black holes that we've ever, me ever measured. They're the furthest away because photons, light, is not a good way to learn about black holes. Black holes are black. No light comes out. So if you want to really probe these systems, you need the gravitational wave detectors. So, so we, we had no idea systems like this even existed. When, when we were planning our observing runs and thinking about what we would measure, one of the big questions we had was, do black holes exist in pairs? We had no idea. We know neutron stars exist in pairs because neutron stars are bright and we can see them with telescopes. We did not know if black holes form in pairs like this, and now we do. All right, and I think you know this one. <laughs> this is a planted question. <laughs> if you put like a hammer in front of the black hole, will it stay there or will it move or anything? 
Okay, so in case you couldn't hear, so the question is if you put something in front of a black hole, will it just stay there or will it move? So I want a bumper sticker on my car and I want it to say, black holes don't suck. So, so people have this idea that black holes are like a vacuum cleaner in the universe. And if there was a black hole nearby, we would all just get inexorably sucked into it and it would be the end of us. So if I were to take the sun and I were to take a black hole the same mass of the sun and I were to swap them in the middle of the night, you wouldn't know. The Earth would just keep on going. The only way you'd know is in the morning the sun didn't come up, it would stay dark. Okay? Black holes don't suck. The Earth would just keep going around just like it does. Now the, the trick with black holes is I can, get a, I can get much closer to the center of a black hole than I can get to the center of the sun. And I can get so close to the center of a black hole where gravity is so strong that there's no turning around, there's no coming out. Okay? So if I were to drop a hammer or a spaceship or an astronaut so close to the black hole that they were, they, I could put them at a place so close that there's no way they could come back out. Okay, but that would be very, very, very close. All right, I have another one right here. How do you know the difference between if it's an earthquake or a gravitational wave? <laughs> Another planted <laughs> question. So, so that's, that's part of my job. So, so when earthquakes happen, they make our detectors jiggle. And lots of other things. And it's much, it doesn't even need to be an earthquake. If someone is sitting at the observatory and drops something in the control room, well, there's a little spike in the data. It's a very, very sensitive measurement. And that's why we built two. Because the odds of a, the same graduate student dropping the same coffee mug <laughs> at the same time in the two different detectors is very, very low. So what we do is we look for the pattern that the signal makes in one detector, the one in Washington, and then we compare that to the pattern that it makes in the other one. And if those patterns match very, very closely, then we're pretty sure it's from the universe and not from something happening on the ground. Great question. If, um, if like you said, how if you go into the black hole, there's no coming out, then if you go in, where do you go? Uh-huh. So, so here, is, here is my dodge when I have to answer that question. Our understanding of how the universe works, we call that the laws of physics, which is really just a bunch of math equations that we can use to understand how things move around. That's basically what physics is all about. The laws of physics that we have, the equations, the math that we can do to calculate how things move around, stop working at the point of a black hole where there's no return. So when you cross into the place where you can't come out anymore, we have no idea what happens because our laws of physics don't work there. It's a great mystery. And it's this, this idea that we got to before where how gravity is sort of different from the other laws of physics. If we can understand how to fit those two together, we might learn what's going on inside of a black hole. But right now, we are at a complete loss. All right, we have one over here. So looking at the video up here, there's a lot of stars that are moving a lot when this is happening. And sort of out far where we're at, obviously we're getting sort of these little waves um, and, and we can kind of sense sort of just the outcome of it. But um, I, I mean, what actually happens to sort of all those planets that are now being whipped around sort of through space in this way? It, you know, considering you said that when they merged, they're going half the speed of light, so presumably much, much faster than the video depicts. Right, so, so what you see here, and you see these stars moving around, those stars aren't physically getting sloshed around in their respective corner of the universe. It's the light from the stars is getting bent because the curvature of the universe is so strong. So it's, it's, it's like moving a magnifying glass over, you know, if, if you had like a book open, and you move the magnifying, there'd be all these crazy distortions in the letters. But the, the words haven't moved. It's just your view of them because the light is getting refracted as it goes around. So, so black holes act like a big lens. And in fact, we use even bigger black holes and, and clusters of galaxies actually as lenses in the universe to measure what's going on in galaxies much, much further away. Now, if, if this event were to happen at the location of our sun, 
okay, then the amount of stretch and shrink that we would experience here as those gravitational waves go by would be about a centimeter, I think. Okay, I'll, I, I would have to go back to my little fact sheet and make sure it's right, but it's about the right scale. So, so you'd kind of notice if you like grew or shrunk by a centimeter for a millisecond, maybe, if you were really paying attention, um, but it would, it would not do any sort of bodily harm. Gravitational waves are incredibly weak, even though there's so much energy involved. So let's say you are an astronaut and um, you get sucked into a black hole. What would you do? Well, first of all, black holes don't suck. <laughs> so, so if you're an astronaut and you purposefully fly into a black hole, right, what would, you, what would happen? Well, we, what would you do? Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> So, so this, is, this is a little, this is interesting, right? So what do you think is more dangerous? Flying into a really big black hole or flying into a medium-sized black hole? The big black hole is less dangerous than the medium black hole. So if you were to, if you were to fly into this black hole, it's about 60 times the mass of the sun. Let's pretend you're gonna fly in head first, okay? So you've got your little spaceship and you're gonna hop out and you're gonna go in head first. So the force of gravity is stronger the closer you are to the object. So if I'm going in, sorry, feet first. If I'm going in feet first, the force of gravity that I feel on my feet is stronger than on my head. So I get stretched out. And I get stretched out so much that I basically turn into a long strand of spaghetti. And the technical term for this that shows up in general relativity textbooks is spaghettification. <laughs> you get stretched out like a long string of spaghetti, and that would be the end of you. Now, if I were to do the same thing, if I were going to jump in feet first to one of the giant black holes, millions of times the mass of the sun at the centers of galaxies, I wouldn't even know. I wouldn't feel it. I would just get swallowed whole. I wouldn't get all stretched out. And I'd be looking around and I'd say, well, this looks a lot like it looked before, but I would not be able to tell anyone that I had made it because nothing can escape the black hole, including my little messages back to the mothership saying that I had fallen in. Well, eventually we're all gonna die, right? <laughs> but, I, but, but inside the black hole, we have no idea why because we really don't understand what's going. Who knows, you might get shot out into a different universe. I don't know. It might just be all lawns and tulips and fluffy bunnies. I don't know. <laughs> Physics breaks. We don't know. Uh, your two devices that you have in Washington and Louisiana, the orientation of the legs, your two tubes, are they in some relationship like somewhat parallel or perpendicular or something? Yes. So, so it's an L shape, right? and they are rotated 90 degrees to one another. Now it's not perfect because the Earth is round, so there's a little bit of this going on, but for the most part, they're rotated 90 degrees. Now this is a really funny story because in the 1980s and 90s, when they were planning to build LIGO, they were planning it as a physics experiment. They wanted to detect gravitational waves. And so you build them rotated like this because then the signal you see in one is basically identical to the signal you see in the other, except for the time delay. Nowadays, we've thought about it more and we realize this is a very good tool for learning about the universe. And gravitational waves come in polarizations just like light does. But the polarization, so for light, a 90 degree rotation means you can measure two polarizations. For gravitational waves, it's a 45 degree rotation. So we basically shot ourselves in the foot for measuring the polarization of gravitational waves by building them in this alignment. So there's a, a tongue-in-cheek movement to go down to Louisiana and turn one of them about 45 <laughs> degrees. But instead, we've, we've done the math and we decide we'll just wait for Virgo to come online because Virgo is rotated and a different side of the Earth. So it, it, it will measure both polarizations for us. And I think we have time for one more question, Margie. How long does it take for a black hole to form? Oh, that is such a good question. And that is something we're gonna learn. So, so one, 
one of the, the great mysteries, right, is how do you form black holes like this? Now, we know, right, we don't even know. We think that black holes like this come from very massive stars that formed in the early universe, okay? But how early is a really good question. And the way we'll learn about this, we can't, we can't tell just by measuring one system like this. We have to tell by measuring lots and lots of them. We call this a population. And by measuring a population, we can see how far away from us do most of the mergers happen. How massive are the two black holes for most of the mergers? One of the things that's very important for this sort of science is how fast are the black holes spinning? And are they spinning kind of in the same direction or are they kind of spinning in random directions? And all these different details show up in the, those wiggles I showed you in our data. If, if the black holes have different masses or if they're spinning in a different way, those wiggles change in a very predictable way. And so as we measure more and more of these things, we can learn about the population and we can start to probe this question of how do they form? Do they form in the very early universe far away and it takes them a long time to come together? Or do they form more recently very close together and then just merge very quickly? Or do they form separately and kind of randomly find themselves in some sort of dense part of a galaxy? We don't really know. And that's, that's the, the, the rich astrophysics to learn there as we, as we detect more and more of these. So during our next observing run that starts this summer, we expect to see maybe five or maybe as many as 20 systems like this based on how successful we were the first time. And then we stop again and we upgrade the machines again and we start collecting data again. And at that point, we will see them, you know, once every one or two weeks. And then we'll really get the good population numbers, the good statistics to learn where these things come from. That's a good question. All right. I think we're going to cut it off, That's but if it. you have more, you want to come down and talk, I'm more than happy to, to field a few more. If you would, thank Dr. Lindenberg for coming out tonight. <laughs>